Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. This is a bit of a weird one, but I recently this year got back into Magic the Gathering, playing Commander specifically. I'd never played Commander before this year, and I thought I'd uh, you know, take you through all the decks that I built this year and stuff. This is my first year playing, so I have built 13 decks, technically 12. The 13th is in the mail and will arrive after the new year, but we're still going to talk about it since it's already built and ordered. Um... I will probably do some more Magic content from time to time on the channel, just because I really enjoy the game. I try to play as much as I can, and it's a lot of fun. I will also have my Mox Field linked in the description if you would like to see any of these decks. They're all public there. Um, just a couple things about my adventure. I started off building my own deck. I didn't buy a pre-con. Um, I started off with my Mono Blue Burrell deck, which has kind of remained in contention for my main deck. Um... There was a different deck that kind of came by later and took a little bit of the thunder from it. That's now my main deck, but generally that was like my first deck and my main deck for the longest period of time. A um, couple things about me, just in general, a lot of my decks do heavily use proxies. Just because I like to play with powerful cards. I don't necessarily have the funds to acquire 12 copies of a powerful card or 9 copies of a powerful card. I need for each of those decks because I generally play at saying not higher power levels but I play in places where for example not having free counter spells just means somebody battle cruiser wins turn five or something like that so um, even if it's not combos I feel like I often need to have very strong interaction because a lot of the places I play I'm often the only person packing the serious interaction um, yeah, we're going to go through each deck, talk about what I like about it, if there's anything I don't like about it, changes I'm going to make. Um, I actually haven't taken... I turned I turned one deck into another deck this year. I had a mono green elf deck. I turned it into a green white. Um, Creature Storm list. Uh, I'm also... My general play style is I'm generally kind of like a combo control player. Most of my decks are variations of combo control decks. Um, I also quite enjoy, like, the Storm style, so that leans pretty nicely to combo control style decks. So a lot of my decks are various different power levels or win-con variations of that theming. But we're going to start off with my first deck. This is Baral, Chief of Compliance, who's a 2-mana 1-3. It's in Sorceries, costs 1 less to cast, and whenever a spell or ability you control would counter a spell, you draw a card. If you do, discard a card. This is very simply a mono blue control deck. It's playing a lot of the mono blue good stuffs um, and some fun toys, and it, send, it tends to try to win through a combo with time warp and um, capsize and mystic sanctuary down here to give myself infinite turns and win through that. But we do have some other cards that can be win conditions in the deck. We have stuff like Sakashima and Metamorph, which can always just copy big beaters. This Hadi Jin here can become a big beater. Um, Talrand and Alandra can make some tokens either to block and buy time or to actually produce a win. But this is just basically draw, go, blue control as, as Garfield intended. And this is probably... It's probably my second favorite deck. It might be my favorite deck still, but it's very much all the cards that I've liked throughout the years. There's a lot of cards in here that are maybe not as great as they could be, but are in here because I really like them. Stuff like this Jace Rin's Prodigy and the Snapcaster Mage are just cards that I've always really enjoyed. So I wanted to put them in a deck. Uh, we do have a little bit of a... We don't have all the wheels, but we do have a Narset plus a Windfall, so more wheels are an option to get put in this deck. Um, so my favorite kind of like, not unique, but more unique cards to this list are stuff like Flow of Ideas, which lets you draw for each island you control. So this can just be a very fat draw spell in this deck. And there's also an instant speed version of it, which I'm not sure is in this current iteration. It kind of flows in and out of the deck. Ah, here it is, Flow of Knowledge. This one, you have to discard two cards afterwards, but you can do it at instant speed. Um, and the thing I noticed, especially with this deck, is because of Brawl's one cost reduction and the fact that he only costs two mana, 
a lot of these like instant sorceries that are maybe just slightly over costed are end up being really good in this deck like um, you know, Factor Fiction being only three mana is generally very good value. It makes it almost always an instant speed draw three, unless the two cards are just really insane. Um, or one of my personal favorite cards in this list is Overwhelming Intellect. This is an old counterspell from Kamigawa um, that I just had from years ago in a box. And it's probably unironically one of my favorite cards, at least one of my favorite cards that isn't a... I like a lot of generically powerful cards, I'm not going to lie. It's my favorite card that's not just like a generically powerful good card. But it's a counter spell that lets you also draw based off CMC of whatever you counter. So if this only costs 5 mana with Brawl out, which it often does, and it gives you an extra loot, you don't feel bad countering like a 3 or a 4 cost creature because you'll end up getting 3 draws and a loot or 4 draws and a loot. Pretty good. Uh, a little narrow, but kind of a fun draw spell in this deck. Search Frost Kanto is just another, like, fun card that I really enjoy um, back in that standard. Uh, I wasn't playing a ton at the time, but it was a card that I saw and I thought was really cool. Uh, the only other interesting thing down here in the lands is this Teleria West, a land which I have really liked, um, especially in this deck, as it lets me transmute it for any zero cost, so I can use it to get a land, often my combo piece Mystic Sanctuary, or it can grab like Mana Crypt, or it can grab a uh, Pact of Negation up here if I need a counter spell for my combo. Um, this is a card that I've been considering putting in other lists, and more recently in my other mono blue list, I've been really liking the Transmute ability there, so I've been looking more at Transmute recently as just like a fun mechanic, but I think this is a fun little card for this deck. This deck is pretty boring. Um, I don't mean boring to play, but I mean like it's not really that unique, not really that special. It's just kind of mono blue draw go control, but that's the way I like to play the game. That's my, you know, it's my favorite way to play magic. So to me, it's a specialist, even if it's not necessarily the most interesting list. All right, next up, I'm going to try to go in order a, as much as I remember. Um, it's going to be a little hard for me to go in order of when I built the decks, but... Hey, you know what? We'll just go down. Uh, Brawl is kind of like my... Also, the one thing I really like about Brawl being kind of a grindy draw-go control deck is that it's very playable in almost all levels. Like, it doesn't have to be playing against the strongest decks to have fun, and it's not necessarily so weak that it gets stomped by strong decks. Because it is a high-interaction deck, that eventually seeks to win with a combo, but because it's a high interaction deck that mainly uses single target interaction, it doesn't like absolutely stomp lower powered decks. Next up is Emery. This is my second to most recent deck, and this is another mono blue list, but this is a storm list. This is meant to be a much faster paced combo deck um, with a bunch of different combos, a bunch of different layers to it. And I really like it. I really like Storm decks. I like complex combo decks. And this is like, this scratches all the, or a good amount of the itches for me. And it's also just a fun, um, a fun commander. Originally, when I first started playing, this was going to be like Urza or Joyra. But I kept putting the, off making this deck enough. And eventually I decided I want to make Emery instead. Because she has some fun interactions that we'll talk about. Um, but Emery Lurker of the Luck is a 1-2 for 2 colorless, 1 blue. The spell costs 1 less for each artifact you control. When it enters the battlefield, mill 4, and you can choose an artifact in your graveyard. You may cast it this turn. You still pay its cost, and timing rules still apply. So what does this deck actually seek to do? This deck is generally winning through a combination of either trying to infinitely loop spells with, where is it, Aetherflux Reservoir, uh, be it through Sensei's top top deck shenanigans with stuff like Mystic Forge and the Reality Chip up here. Or uh, using Brain Freeze off Infinite Storm Counts to kill people with that. There's also the main combo in the deck is Emery herself. You use a one of two creatures, either this Chakra Retriever, which is whenever you cast a spell, you may untap a creature, or this 
where it is here it is Miriam's Spy, which is essentially the same thing wherever you cast, but it's only whenever you cast an artifact. And what both of these do essentially is allow you to infinitely cast any of your zero drop artifacts from your graveyard or any of your one drop artifacts or something like that. If we have one of our artifact cost reductors like Ethereum Sculptor or Foundry Inspector or um, Cloud Key, I believe is in the deck as well. Yeah, Cloud Key allows us to essentially loop like Conjurer's Bobble to draw an entire deck, loop Lotus Petals to make infinite mana, loop Mirsha's Bobbles to put unlimited draw triggers on the stack, loop uh, Tormod's Crypts just to have infinite storm count, loop Urza's Bobbles for again infinite draw triggers on the stack. Um, and there's just the rest of the deck is just interaction and tutors to try to get the game plan to go off. Um, there's a lot of little fun cards in this deck. Hope of Gear for is a fun little card here. It's basically a silence effect, um, but you have to hit the person with the Hope of Gear for and then sack it. And you get the silence effect. Uh, some of the other fun cards in this deck are the Transmute cards, the Drift of Phantasms here at 3, and the Muddle the Mixtures down here at 2. Uh, these get you a ton of different cards in this deck, be it uh, Intuition for combo wins. Uh, for the 3 cost, we have Miriam Spy, a combo piece. We have Foundry Sector, which is a possible combo piece. Shimmer Mirror, which would be a possible combo piece. Um, we can actually, it's a little expensive, but you could actually do Transmute grab trinket mage trinket mage grabs um a zero or a one man artifact that's also a thing that you could do you also just grab a tutor like we're of invention just tutor for it that way um but yeah that's fun this deck has a lot of very like surprising uh lines that you can do with it um Trying to see if there's any other like super interesting cards in the deck that I want to talk about. I've really been I really like this Moon Snare prototype. It's just a fun little card. It's like a um spring leaf drum, but for artifacts, just a nice little ramp card for blue. Um besides that, it's pretty standard artifact high power shenanigans. But this is probably one of my more favorite decks to play right now because it's new, but also just because of the the way the deck actually plays out. Next up is my Esper Kenrith deck. This is a Kenrith uh, Esper control deck. I was looking for an Esper uh, control, like spell singularity control commander. Um, eventually I decided just to do Kenrith and just focus on the Esper um, colors. So that's blue, black, and white. So what Kenrith does is Kenrith is four and one white for five, five, and he essentially has five different abilities here. Uh, one gives Trample and Haste, one gives plus one, plus one counters, one gains you five life, one draws a card, and one puts a creature card from a graveyard to the battlefield under its owner's control. So for this deck, only the bottom three are relevant. Um, occasionally, you actually can use some of the other abilities if you have access to, like, Command Tower. Um, kind of a fun little interaction. But I am mainly built around the bottom three. Which the bottom three are actually great for... A sort of control list giving you life to stay in the game letting you draw cards and letting you put any creatures that someone killed back onto the battlefield um, it is also a win condition with infinite mana since you can make uh, all three of your opponents draw their entire decks out and essentially deck themselves because it's target player draws a card not just you um, and it just plays a lot of my favorite like low cost value creatures and seeks to win through infinite mana combos with uh, Peregrine Drake, Narhumeha, Archaeomancer, Ghostly Flicker, Displace kind of shenanigans to generate infinite mana. Um, there's also Dramatic Reversal, Iprosacron Scepter in here as way as another way to make infinite mana. And besides that, it's just a pile of little value creatures and control cards, stuff like. Grand Arbiter and Notion Thief and Farewell and Damn. Um, so just a collection of my favorite instants and sorceries, really. Uh, Necros in here be just for fun, just because I, I like Necros a card, even though realistically sometimes it doesn't get you there in this deck. It's fun just to cast it, pay 30 life, draw 30 cards. I I've won at that point, even if the game is not uh, over. This deck, while being quite good, is actually kind of slow. Um, much like Brawl, the actual combo itself is relatively expensive. The cheapest one 
uh, outside of the dramatic scepter lines being seven mana and two cards so not not so high that's nowhere near doable but not so low that i would consider it a massively high powered deck it also is not running a ton of the super fast mana it's got some fast mana mana crypt and soul ring obviously but not the entire suite not a whole bunch of tutors to power stuff out it's looking to play a slow grindy control game and eventually just win speaking of proxies this is also um I sometimes will do like themes with the proxies in my deck. So like this one is mainly filled with cards that are either in the art style or actually are the um, Japanese Strixhaven arts, the ones that look kind of like almost um, paintings almost. And I have a lot of them done either with the English text on them or if it's a card that doesn't naturally have a printing in that style, done in that style. Um, that's kind of like this deck's theme, I guess, for lack of a better term. But yeah, this is a super fun deck. Um, it's probably, again, I love all my decks, but this is probably a deck I reach for a good amount because, again, much like Brawl, this is very much a deck that can play at a whole bunch of power levels. I'm not necessarily saying I would slap it against a whole bunch of precons in the way I might do Brawl because Brawl is meant to be even grindier. This deck can be quite a bit faster, has a bit more consistent tutoring um, for the pieces it needs. But... This isn't a deck that I necessarily feel bad about playing against versus like medium power decks or even some higher power decks just due to the fact that it still runs all the, or if not most of the powerful interaction, but it realistically wins through a slower um, game plan that involves, you know, you know, it's a control deck. It's meant to sit there for a while before it actually presents a win. So let's go on to the next one. So this is the one and only precon I ever bought. I bought the fairy precon um, from Wilds of Eldraine. I thought it was really cool. I love fairies. I love because they're just tricksy little guys. Uh, this list actually recently got changed from Italian the Kindly Lord list to an Alayla list. I was just kind of feeling like Italian didn't um, do what I wanted to do. This is probably my least powerful or my most purposely lower powered deck. This one and another deck we'll see later. So this is probably the deck I play the most when people don't want to play against like infinites or that kind of stuff. This is one of my few decks that doesn't have combos and stuff in it. Um, but I was finding that Talion, when I would play it against those lower power decks, would either just hard win me the game because they don't know like they need to kill him ever and just let me draw 20 cards off him. Or he just sits around and doesn't do anything because everybody's mana decks or decks are not optimized. So the mana values are not spread out enough. Um, so I swapped to Alayla Cunning Conqueror from the Precon just because she's cool. I always would draw her and never found a way to use her. She's also kind of more fairy-like to me. You know, she's a little bit more tricksier. Uh, she's a four mana, two, and Demir, one blue, one black. Flying, whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, you get a one, one black fairy rogue. And whenever one more fairies deals combat damage to a player, go target creature that player controls. So she can eventually win you the game. Um, I also committed to the fairy, uh, the fairy theme, so not a single creature in the deck is non-fairy, um, even though realistically I could have gone with like a flash theme, for example, for this deck. But I don't know, this one's still in the a little bit in the tuning and tinkering process right now. But it's a lot of fun, uh, and Talion is in other decks already, so I'm not really sad about losing my my talion as my fairy deck like i have a you'll see later but talion is also my cedh commander so not really like too sad to lose him and it just plays a lot of the good fairies be they from the precon or from general magic stuff like fairy harbinger fairy mastermind glenelendra archmage um nimrus who could also be the commander for this deck a little bit more card draw but less like win con Tegwheel, the other um, commander from the precon. Kind of like the uh, the special cards for this deck. Not special, but the the cool cards for this deck, in my opinion, are um, Raise the Palisade. Raise the Palisade is a card that's very been very nice with it, or very happy with. It's kind of like a Psych Rift. Uh, 
kind of effect where you choose a creature type and then bounce everything of non that creature. So kind of like a, a mass bounce effect, kind of like a psych rift, but it still doesn't block your st or doesn't hit your stuff. Um, so pretty cool in this deck. Um, Coat of Arms also very fun in this deck. Uh, it's each creature gets plus one, plus one for each creature on the battlefield that shares at least one creature type with it. I generally do not deploy this until I intend on attacking for like a win with it or until I have a, a big enough board, but this can just be, you know, be plus seven, plus seven to each of my fairies, that kind of stuff. Uh, Bitter Blossom being another really fun card in this deck and Kindred Discovery, especially since a lot of fairies have flying, um, is very, very good and is a lot of fun in this deck. It's one of the main reasons. This is one of those cards that makes playing a typal deck good. So what Kindred Discovery does is when it ETBs, you choose a creature type and whatever creature you control, the chosen type enters the battlefield or attacks draw a card. Now this is per creature. This is not whenever a, a, you know you attack with the chosen creature, you get a draw card. This is per creature. So if I swing with three fairies, I get three cards. This card is insane. And it's on attack. It's not even on damage. It's on attack. That's nuts. The next best one is like Reconnaissance Mission, which is a similar effect, but the creature has to actually do damage to a player, um, or deal combat damage to a player in order to get the effect. Um, some of my favorite fairies in the list are uh, this Archmage of Echoes here, which whenever you play a fairy or wizard, it just straight up copies it. That's That can get real fun real quick. Um Nettling Nuisance is also pretty cool. It's essentially a clone that lets you... It's a it's it's a clone that has flash, and it still remains a fairy. It still has flying, I believe. Yeah, and it has flying still. So that's pretty cool. Um, and Miss Blind Click is probably another old-school fairy favorite. Uh, where this one comes in, you can essentially sack a fairy. or So... You do technically sack it, but what happens essentially is the fairy goes under Mistbind Click, and once Mistbind Click leaves play, the other fairy comes back. But well, taps all lands that target player controls, so you can use that instant speed to like stop someone's turn. Basically, kind of cool, kind of tricksy, very, uh, very fairy to me, you know. And Spell Star Sprite, obviously, just being the most fun fairy card ever, which is a flash flying whenever it enters the battlefield. Counter target spell cover may cost X or less, where X is the number of fairies you control. Just a a sweet little fun and card to get them with, you know, very tricksy, very gremlin energy, but one of my lower power decks. So I don't necessarily play it as much as I play the others, but definitely still a deck I very much enjoy. And if you haven't noticed a theme, I really like a blue decks and I also really like blue black decks. But we're going to be breaking that streak here because we're going to be talking about my Glissa, the trader deck. This is a black green artifact kind of graveyard deck. And this is this is a deck I don't reach for as much. I'm in the middle of kind of doing a, a bit of an overhaul on this deck. But it's still a lot of fun. I love this deck. Um, it's not like Emery. Emery is more of a fast combo deck. This is more of a slower, grindier deck. Um, we'll talk specifically about the stuff that Glissa does that makes her powerful. So she is a one black, two green, three, three, first strike, death touch, which means she basically kills anything. Um, if it attacks you, whenever a creature in a poke controls is put to a graveyard, you may return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. So another graveyard artifact deck, funnily enough, um, <laughs> like Emery, but kind of wanting to play a lot grindier of a game this time. Um, this list still doesn't have doesn't have a lot of my changes I'm going to be making soon to it, but I'm still going to talk about it because a lot of the changes are kind of generic engine pieces and not necessarily like uh, changing what the deck actually functionally does. So how does this deck play? Well, this deck is a on-board control deck, basically. You run a lot of Fleshbag Marauder, Merciless Executioner, these kind of creatures that whenever they ETB make you sack, makes everybody sack a creature. And then with Glissa out, that's three artifact recursion triggers. So you run a whole bunch of just cheap artifacts that you can can trip out. Stuff like the two Bobbles, Mishra's Bobble, and Urza's Bobble. Stuff like Nihil Spellbomb, Iker Well Sparing, Conjurer's Bobble, just all these different little things you can loot away. Soul Guide Lantern to get a card draw. Um, 
and just get stuff back. Uh, there's also some other like single target effects. A little bit of sacrifice in here with stuff like braids. Um, a little bit of recursion with stuff like Eternal Witness and Timeless Witness. And besides that, just a relatively standard control package. General Wincon is Bolas Citadel Aetherflux Reservoir shenanigans, or there's also this Cabal Paladin out here. That's whenever you cast a historic spell, it deals two damage to each opponent, which especially on turns that you're getting, you know, four or five, six baubles back with Glissa, you can just start machine gunning people. Marionette Mester also doing a similar thing, but to a, a single opponent. Um, well, we're going to talk about some of the uniquely fun cards in this deck, because there's a lot of cards that have really fun, unique interactions with Glissa, or cool interactions with Glissa. Obviously, I mentioned all the Marauder kind of effects. But the Necron Precon actually gave us some really interesting cards to this deck. So there's this Lonehurst Heavy Destroyer. This is essentially a Fleshbag Marauder Merciless Executioner, but it itself is an artifact. So that means it'll die, or if you sack it to its trigger, they'll go to the graveyard, and then the Glissa triggers will see everything else die, and you can put it back into your hand. Really cool. Also Necron Deathmark. Similar thing, but instead of a sacrifice, it just picks off a single creature also very cool in this deck um walking ballista is very cool in this deck if you have the mana because you can essentially you know whatever it is you pay four mana for the ballista you shoot two one ones you get the ballista back out of the graveyard afterwards um and there's another artifact with that kind of similar line of thought executioner's capsule is insane in this deck uh you can cast it for a black and then pay a black and a colorless tap it, sack it to destroy a non-black creature, and then you just get it right back because <laughs> it's an artifact. So you can essentially, with enough mana, keep every non-black creature off the, the field at a time. Really cool card. Um, some other cool cards in this deck. Vona's Hunger is probably one of the more interesting uh, cards for this deck in particular. It might just be good enough to see play in most decks, to be honest with you. It's uh, three mana for an instant. Each opponent sacks a creature. If you have the city's blessing instead, which is if you have ten or more permanents, each one sacrifices half the creatures they control rounded up. This is just like a, you know, a good, at minimum, three for one, but can be even more. Um, it's not too hard to have the city's blessing because you're going to have a whole bunch of little artifacts around, um, and it counts your lands and all that stuff, so... Very easy to have the City's Blessing and trigger that effect. Um, and with Glissa, that can just be an absolutely insane amount of recursion. Um, there's also another card I want to talk about. This is like probably one of the best artifact payoff cards in the entirety of Magic. It just doesn't get that much love because it's in green, and there aren't that many green artifact things, but it's Sar Sarnath Steel Seeker. It's whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under control, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may reveal it and put it in your hand. If you don't put the card in your hand, you may put it into your graveyard. So this is essentially like almost like an explorer trigger, actually, I guess. I guess this actually might be explorer, basically. But it's whenever an artifact ETBs, you can look at the top. If it's a land, it goes into your hand, essentially giving you a draw card. Or you can put it in your graveyard, which is especially with a creature like Lissa, who could just bring artifacts back. This means you can just like mill over your artifacts and then get them back with Glissa. Or you can just leave it on top. You don't actually have to discard it. You can just leave it on top. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, I think there's a really cool land in this deck I wanted to mention. Yeah, here it is, the Mycosynth Gardens. This is a land that came out this year that I've been I really like in this deck. So what it does is it taps for a color, so you can pay one and tap it to add one mana of any color, or you can pay X and tap it, and it becomes a copy of target non-token artifact you control with mana value X. So you can use it to copy stuff like your soul ring, use it to st copy stuff like um, Aether Flux Reservoir I've done before to essentially hard cast my way up to Aether Flux Reservoir shoot shots. Um, use it to copy stuff like cloud key for artifact cost reduction if you need it there's just a lot of fun stuff you can copy um you can actually one thing that I, you can do it doesn't work exactly but you'd have to have a lot of mana but you can actually copy since there's divining top tap the top swap it tap the other tap the other top swap them again and just 
you need the infinite landfall triggers, but that's kind of a cool interaction. Um, or something interesting to consider. Uh, you could also copy something like Haywire Might or any of your creatures that ha have pretty good abilities. You know, if you copy something like um, like Worm Coil Engine or something mid-combat and just block with it. Actually, I guess it's tapped. Or uh, the Haywire Might's a really good one, actually. Um, but yeah, this is this is a deck I said, I, this is probably my deck that needs the most work still. Um, you can see down here on the sideboard the cards I'm getting for the deck kind of making the combo wins wins a little bit cleaner with the Chain of Smug, Wither Bloom Apprentice, some One Ring shenanigans, and some more Mana Ramp. But even with the deck how it is now, um, this deck originally started off leaning a lot more into the Aristocrat sub-theme, but it just kind of like fizzled out a little bit, so now I'm just kind of making it a lot more of just like Gliss's ability is mainly her value instead of just having, instead of just trying to win purely through artifact sacking. But it's still a very fun deck, and it's in colors you don't necessarily assume an artifact deck to be in. And it's a pretty unique deck, so I, I, I still like this deck quite a bit. I love all my babies. <laughs> Next up is probably what I would consider my favorite deck, my main deck. This is my Kess Dissident Mage. This is a Grixis Spellslinger combo list. Um, this is probably... I try to use a different win con in every deck, even if they all end up being some form of combo deck. I try to use different ones. So this is my uh, like wheels slash Thassa's Oracle deck. Um, looks relatively similar to like a CDH list without the fast mana, really. Um, but this is also my one deck that my eventual goal is to get m most, if not all, the cards in paper, um, like non-proxied. Whereas most of my other decks, I don't really care. The whole deck could be proxies, to be honest with you. Um, Time Twister probably being the exception for that because that's a, it's a spicy meatball. But what Kess does is she is one colorless, one blue, one black, one red for a 3-4 flying. During each of your turns, you may cast in or sorcery spell from your graveyard. If spells cast this way, you'll be putting your graveyard exile it. This ability seems a little innocuous, but there's a lot of powerful things you can do with it, such as keeping counter spells in your graveyard, re doubling up on tutors, getting value out of cards like See the Truth, which is one of the more unique cards in this deck, which is essentially an anticipate style effect, but if the spell is cast from anywhere other than your hand, you get to essentially put those three cards into your hand instead of um, just picking one out of the three, so kind of cool effect there. But the main reason to play cast, well, not the main reason, you can play it without this reason, but the cool thing you can do with her is the CDH style Thassa's Oracle wins with Demonic Consultation and Tainted Pack. Both of these cards essentially let you exile until you hit a name, either the named card or Tainted Pack lets you go until you exile two cards with the same name or until you find a card you want. But because Kess lets you cast these from your graveyard, this means that these are essentially become one card combos with your commander. You can Demonic Consult to find the Thoracle, play the Thoracle, Demonic Consult, the rest of your library away with uh, Kez's ability. This is also my deck that plays stuff like Brain Freeze, Underworld Breach. Um, I don't have a Lion's Eye Diamond in here. I probably will eventually. But for now, the Underworld Breach is kind of mainly for value, and there are sometimes you get there with the Brain Freeze shenanigans. Um, this deck plays Jace, Wheeler's Mystery, which is basically a backup copy of Thassa's Oracle. This is deck also plays Talion as like another similar like almost Rhystic Study style effect. Um, he's probably Talion's probably my favorite card. Um, my favorite like legendary creature nowadays. Like I just really like how much card advantage he is. He's in my favorite colors. He's got cool art. Um, but Kess is pretty cool too. I just wish there was a, a cooler printing of her right now. We don't really have a, any really cool uh, printings. Just kind of like one secret layer that doesn't look that good. Um, but I have cool altars and cool proxies, and so that's all that matters. There's also kind of a wheels sub-theme in here. Um, so I can kind of play it at semi-lower power tables, or just if I'm having fun. Like I played in the game last week where I decided uh, I basically was going to pretend that Thassa's Oracle stuff was not in the deck and go for a wheel win, and I ended up getting there with some... Orcish Bowmasters, Underworld Breach, uh, Wheel of Fortune shenanigans. Um, just shooting people with the Orcish Bowmasters. Um, 
a lot of fun stuff like Notion Thief and Narset Party Avails and Shielder the Apocalypse to get advantage off the um, the Wheel Effects. So this is my favorite deck. This is the one deck that I do hope to eventually one day own the complete thing in paper, even though a lot of it is proxies right now. Except that uh, except that uh, that that time twister is probably uh probably staying where it is. Maybe uh maybe the rest of the the reserve list is uh is staying <laughs> proxies. Next up is my one deck that I have. The only deck I actually probably like quote unquote took apart was my mono green elf deck, and I converted it to this Silvala Heart of the Wild deck. This is a de this is one of two decks I have that are my no proxy list, just in case I play against people who don't like proxies for some reason. Um, or if people, so there are some people who assume proxies with power level, even though you could build a twenty dollar deck that can compete a they're not twenty dollar, but you probably build a hundred dollar deck that could compete a CDH table and have a you know above twenty percent chance of winning. Um, and you could build a twenty thousand dollar deck that loses to pre-cons pretty easily but i totally get where they're coming from it makes sense if people don't want to play against super powerful cards individually even if the end goal is maybe just a you know cast a whole bunch of wheels or something like that not to say that cast deck was bad or anything like that but you know just just to have the option in case there's an issue um i also wanted a green deck uh Feel my shopper joking that I always play the same kind of decks, so I uh, I made a green creature deck. Except then I turned it into a combo storm deck because <laughs> I have a type and I like it. Um, but Savala, if you don't know what she does, she is a one mana green and a white for a two four, and she has a unique ability called Parlay, which you tap her. Each creature reveals the top card of the, or each player reveals the top card of their library. Freeze an online card reveal this way. You get one green, gain a life, then everybody draws a card. So it looks group huggy. This deck is not group huggy. This deck is can be blisteringly fast off the right draws. It is actually a relatively... I'm relatively proud of this list for its budget. I think it punches around its weight class, actually. Um, it, it, it can hang with some pretty powerful decks, um, even if its budget is maybe missing some of the more powerful tutors and stuff like that to make the deck a bit more consistent. But... That's also kind of the fun part. It's a little bit less consistent, so you can play it at lower power level tables a little bit, you know? Um, but this deck also wins in a very funny way, or at least not... Maybe not funny is not the great way to say it, but a, a, an interesting way. It, wield, it wins through casting a big hurricane. That is the goal of the deck. Make infinite mana and cast a big hurricane to kill everybody except for myself. Um, <laughs> which is cool. It's cool and silly. People generally tend to enjoy getting blasted by a hurricane, even if um, the deck can be a little bit, you know, bl fast, a little bit powerful. People generally don't mind dying to a hurricane for 50 or something funny like that. Um, but the deck is more or less an elf sub theme deck. Not every creature is an elf. There are some very powerful creatures in here that aren't elves, stuff like Teemer Sabretooth, the new Uncommon from Ixalan that has a silence effect on it, um, Selfless Spirit being a personal favorite card of mine in this deck. It's basically just another way to protect your board, but you can preemptively cast it and it triggers some of your creature synergy stuff. Um, but there are a lot of elves in the deck, be it they, the low drops to generate mana or... Uh, the higher drops that generate mana, or the Azuri, which is like the backup win con, um, or the Voice of Many, or the Beast Whisper, which are draw engines, uh, or draw effects. Pretty cool, pretty cool. There's a lot of lines in the deck with Teamer Sabretooth, um, which is in the deck, and Kogula, which can be used to bounce like Eternal Witnesses and Timeless Witnesses to get back. Are spells that untap stuff. Oh, I should have mentioned this. The goal of the deck is to use a lot of untap spells to generate a whole bunch of mana. Um, so we have a lot of these instants or sorceries that just untap all of our creatures. Um, I think we have one, two, three, four. Really, only four. I guess where I played more than four of those effects. But you do churn through a good chunk of the deck, so you really, I guess, only need to play four of the effects. Uh, five Village Bellringer. And your goal is just to like loop all those effects to untap 
all your mana dorks to make infinite mana. There's also some other um, options down in the artifacts, which helps us make infinite mana with Staff of Domination and Umbral Manas. Both ways that just, if a creature taps for enough mana, be it Elvish Archdruid or um, Priest of Titania or Karmetra, which is a, a mana dork for your Devotion to Green or Wirewood Channel or any of those, if they tap for enough, it just makes it produce infinite mana. Which, off our infinite mana, we find ways to win. Um, it runs a lot of the stereotypical go-wide creature draw support, stuff like Shamanic Revelation and Regal Force being a pretty cool card in this deck, which can tutor off Fierce Empath, uh, which is just a nice, cool little elf tutor in the deck that lets you search for a creature with the mana value 6 or higher, so it can grab Kogla, which is a combo piece, or Regal Force, which is a uh, draw engine. Besides that, it's a pretty standard deck. Dried Arbor down here in the land. I just picked this up as a kid randomly. I got it from a deck. Um, the land base in this deck isn't very good because obviously it's one of my no proxy decks. So I'm not saying the deck, the mana base is bad. Like the mana base is fine. But if you look at a lot of my other decks, I tend to play very high fetch land amounts, very high, you know, shocks and stuff like that. This deck doesn't really have shocks or fetches, that kind of stuff. Um, very light on the lands because it is a very trim deck uh it says 2.57 down here with the mana cost but we have to remember that not only does our commander make mana but we have like seven mana dorks and then like five or six creatures that produce more mana like large amounts of mana when tapped so this deck actually spits out mana like crazy um this is a really fun deck i found it i found a, a similar list online and just kind of built around it and did some testing in my own but for being a non-blue deck it's actually a deck i've enjoyed quite a lot all right i'm gonna try to pick this up a little bit so this isn't uh, a 40 hour video because uh there's still six decks to get through so next is rowan sign of war from wilds of eldraine this is a deck that i almost instantly knew i wanted to build as soon as i saw the card it's screaming, do dumb stuff with me. Uh, Rowan is a three mana, one colorless, one black, one red, four two with menace, and you tap her spells you cast this turn that are black and or red, cost X less to cast, or X is the amount of life you lost this turn. Use only as a sorcery. So this deck is very simple. We're trying to pay a huge amount of life, um, ideally like 30, tap Rowan, and then cast a absolutely massive... Um, Crackle with Power, Exsanguinate, or Torment of Hailfire for like a million and just absolutely nuke people out of orbit. Um, this deck needs a bit more tuning. Um, sometimes it doesn't go directly how I want it to, but it is undoubtedly a very powerful deck. And I feel like part of that is just that I haven't practiced enough with it um, in terms of what hands are keepable and what hands aren't. There's also a lot of like little combos in the deck stuff like dual caster mage twin flame is infinite uh dual caster mages with haste so that's a win um there's also the bola citadel aetherflex reservoir and since it's divining top in the deck just because bola citadel is another way to use life a flex reservoir can get our life back up so we don't kill ourselves and the top is just pretty good value necropotence is in the deck um good way to lose a lot of life tap rowan and then win on end step with uh where is it emergence zone this is a land that I've been very impressed with, especially in my higher power decks. You pay one, tap it, sack it. You may cast spells this turn as though they had flash. So you can you essentially pay a whole life, whole bunch of life in a necro opponents, tap Rowan, go to your end step, get the cards off the necro. After you get the cards off the necro, it's still during cleanup, you crack the emergence zone and go off from there because uh, you'll still have the cost reduction from Rowan. It's a pretty cool interaction. Um, just a lot of sweet cards in this deck. Stuff like Peer into the Abyss to draw half your deck. Um, stuff like uh, Vidless Broker of Blood to draw a whole bunch of cards whenever you lose life. Some of my favorite creatures like Dark Confidant are in this deck. I absolutely love this creature. Dark Confidant and Snapcaster Mage are probably two of my most favorite creatures. At least non-legendary creatures. Uh, other fun stuff in the deck like... Uh, this Plunge into Darkness, this is a card that I've been very impressed with, and I just had randomly sitting in a box somewhere. Uh, 
the main thing we do with this deck is it's two mana for an instant. Uh, look, pay X life, look at the top X cards of your library, put one of those into your hand, and remove the rest from the game. So you tap it, pay 30 life, tap Rowan, and you find your Exsanguinate or your Commune with Lava to find the rest of your stuff or whatever and just go nuts. Uh, Tybalt's Trickery is essentially a counter spell in red. Very fun in this deck. Um, one of my favorite cards in this deck, even though it's not the best, is Pyroblast, just because I have the store um, version of it. I think I can actually get the printing here. I have this one here. I have this printing here with Anime Rowan on it, which looks awesome with the Anime Rowan Planeswalker. Really like it. I don't know. Just me. I love it. Another alternative win con in this deck, which is actually like... I've actually done it before. It's probably one of my favorite EDH wins ever is Tendrils of Agony. Uh, about a month ago, I got a win off hard casting 30 spells and casting a Tendrils of Agony. It felt so awesome. I love Tendrils. It's my one of my favorite cards. As I've mentioned, I love Storm cards. And just getting to play a deck where I can either use it just to gain back some life to pay more with Rowan or even use it as a win con is a lot of fun. Yogg will also a lot of fun in this deck. This next deck, I'm just going to go over really quick because it's not, it's nothing special. I've only played it. I don't even think I've got to play it yet. It's very new inclusion, but this is my CDH deck. This is Talion, the Kindly Lord, who is a good CDH commander. So I was like, okay, I'll build a CDH deck out of him. So I have a deck for that. Uh, I'm probably going to bring it with me this week and try to play it. But this is a CDH deck that I basically ripped right off like a top 18. I changed maybe like two cards so nothing super unique in here um probably the coolest thing is talion's unique win condition which is blood chief's ascension basically whenever talion triggers and they lose two life oh i forgot to say what talion does my apologies talion is a fairy two generic one blue one black as he enters the battlefield choose a number between one and ten whenever an opponent casts a spell with the mana value power or toughness equal to the chosen number the player loses two life and you draw a card so he's essentially a draw engine in the command zone. But Blood Chief's Ascension, whenever they lose two life, you may put a quest counter uh, at the end of turn on it. And if a if uh, Blood Chief's Ascension has three or more quest counters on it, and anyone and any opponent puts a card into their graveyard from anywhere, uh, Blood Chief's Ascension, you may have it deal two damage to them, and uh, you may gain two life, which is a really cool effect. Um, and also means, like, Stuff like wheeling suddenly really, really hurts your enemies, um, and it's a really good way to get some life back. Uh, this is playing all the standard CEDH stuff, um, especially for a more a bit of a more controlling list, so a little bit more higher mana value. Stuff like Sakashima and Spark Dribble to copy Talion on different numbers or even on the same number to get value. Um, stuff like Gilded Drake standard win cons through Thassa's Oracle shenanigans. Um, yeah, not a super unique deck, but that's it's a CDH deck. It's meant to, be, meant to be as strong as humanly possible, and I do get to play one of my favorite legends, so that's a win. Up next is Tesa Karlov. This is one of my favorite decks, despite me not really knowing much or really playing the archetype before coming into uh, Commander. I actually quite enjoy Aristocrats, especially this kind of Aristocrats, which is a volume-based Aristocrats, where we're making a million tokens and sacrificing all of them to kill people. Really fun strategy. I really like it. Um, I've actually been thinking about making other Aristocrats decks, if I could stop making Storm decks um, for one minute. But what Tasa Karlov does is if a dying if a creature dying causes a trigger ability of a permit you control a trigger, it triggers an additional time. So she's a death harmonicon. And then creature tokens control a vigilance and lifelink. Sometimes relevant, but the main thing we care about her is our that first part. And that doubles up so many powerful abilities, so many nice stuff. All your blood artist, and you probably know what this commander does, she's super popular. But for anybody who doesn't, all your blood artist, Zulapoint, cutthroat, triggers, um, anything that triggers whenever something dies, you get two of them now just really really fun make a ton of creatures sack a ton of creatures drain out your opponents and because she doubles it the drain is actually relatively fast like it's a pretty big difference having to go from sacking 40 creatures to kill a table to, to 20 creatures to kill a table and if you have two blood artist effects on the table 
Now you only need 10 creatures to sack, and you can get to 10 creatures really easily, especially when a lot of your creatures that, whenever they die, turn into a token, now turn into two tokens whenever they die. So now you're making, you know, it's very easy to do something like play Hanger Back Walker for four, sack Hanger Back Walker to like a altar or anything like that, and just straight up kill the table because you have two Blood Artist effects and suddenly you're negging everybody for 27, 30 damage, something in that range. Um, Drivnod, Carnage Dominus is essentially just another copy of Tesa. He also has that Death Harmonic on effect. Um, not a lot of other stuff in here. Nim Death Mantle. This is kind of a this is a combo piece. There are a couple combo lines in the deck with Karmic Guide, Revel Arc, and then the Niv Death Mantle plus um, either of the Altars, Phyrexian or Ashnod, and any of the uh, creatures that turn into little more creatures whenever they get sacked. Often means that you can just infinitely sack stuff over and over. Alindra the Dusk Rose being a particularly powerful card in this deck whenever another creature dies you put a plus one plus one counter on it so tesa will double those counter so she'll put two on her and then whenever she dies you get x11 white vampire creature tokens with lifelink where it's her power so whenever you sack her you get double tokens so even to be like super generous if you play alendra and like a doom traveler here sack doom traveler two counters go on alendra sack one of the, to the Traveler makes two tokens, sack both of those tokens, four more counters on Alindra. Now she's a seven something, sack her 14 um, little guys. So literally Doom Traveler, Alindra, Tesa, and like a skeleton or, or Azula port effect is a kill um, by itself. Very, very cool. Uh, Besides that, just a lot of very standard stuff. Dictator, Post, Grave, Pack to kind of control the board. Smothering Tithe and Meat Hook Massacre. Um, Smothering Tithe for Ramp and Meat Hook Massacre just to kind of, you know, another Blood Artist style effect. Uh, probably the coolest card in the deck, um, or two of the cooler, slightly more unique cards in the deck. I don't think they're super unique, but Spawning Pit has always impressed me. Uh, it's sack a creature, put a charge counter on it. So you sack a creature, you get two charge counters, and you remove two charge counters from it. Or sorry, you only get one. You only get one per sack. It doesn't actually double it because anything that happens after the sack um, is not doubled. So it's a way to just like, recycle your creatures. Um, pretty cool. Uh, Rally the Ancestors is one I've always I've been very impressed with. Um, I win off this card a lot, so much so that I'm thinking I might want to put another one of these effects in here. Uh, return to each creature with converted man cost X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Exile those creatures that be in your next end step. Exile rally. Well, you don't need to worry about the ball getting exiled because you're just going to be sacking them all anyway <laughs> to kill your opponent, hopefully. Because a lot of the creatures in this deck only need two mana. So, you know, you put two mana into this for four, you get back a whole bunch of these little guys that just pop into more creatures whenever they're sacrificed. Maybe even get a sack outlet at, back like Viscerous here. Um, Skull Clamp is also really good in this deck. I know saying Skull Clamp is a good card is a bit, like, no dip, but Skull Clamp does actually get doubled by Tesa, so it means Skull Clamp now draws four cards, um, which is uh, insane, and means I probably should put more, uh, maybe another Equipment Tutor in the deck, um, possibly, because that is a very powerful effect. But yeah, this is... It's like the deck having infinites. This is probably my deck that relies on infinites, the the least to produce wins um so this is a deck i will pull out quite frequently um and i do really enjoy and do like tuning with even if sometimes i get the numbers feel a little off and the deck doesn't run as smooth as i would like it to I actually won a game with this deck like two weeks ago because someone had a ward on a uh permanent that was discard a card and i was able to discard um like, I think I discarded, like, Viscerous here or something, and then able to res it off a Karmic Guide and then sack the Karmic, or res it off a Revel Arc and then sack the Revel Arc to the effect to win. There was some chain like that where I needed exactly enough mana, but this is an archetype that I might pursue next year, making another Aristocrat-style sacrifice deck. Um, I have 13 decks now. I'm probably going to stop. Uh, maybe only make one or two this year. My, this year I'm mainly going to devote to actually like 
tuning the decks and getting some of the cards I want for them. I'm also waiting for the uh, Final Fantasy set. All right, we're almost at an hour, but you know what? You've been here this long. Next up is my uh, Yuriko, the Tiger Shadow deck. This is my other no proxy list. Um, and it's just doing Yuriko things. Uh, Yuriko, if you don't know what she does, it's whenever a ninja deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top card of their library, put that card into your hand, each penalty lays the life equal to that card's mana cost. So it's basically just Yuriko, a lot of little unblockable things that you can ninjutsu stuff on, and then big fatties for you to flip over. I don't have all the good big fatties for this style of deck, um, but, you know, such is life. You can't have all of the big fatties you want. And definitely, if this was a deck I would pump more money into, this is definitely a deck that could get quite a bit better, despite already being a super powerful deck. This is actually one of the best commanders, I think, to build on a budget. You can very easily crank out a very powerful list with this commander on a budget. Um, but there are a couple of like high-cost delve spells and a couple of really high-cost cards that I don't have that would be pretty good for the deck. But let's not talk about what the deck could be. Let's talk about what the deck has and some of my favorite cards in the deck. Um, Miss Syndicate Ninja is a card I'm very impressed with. Uh, it's whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you create a token that's a copy of it. So this gets out of control real quick, and you end up doing six, seven, eight Yuriko flips a turn. Absolutely disgusting. Uh, Tasuko Umazawa's Fugitive is pr absolutely insane in this deck. It's creatures with power or toughness one or less can't be blocked. Most of your ninjas have power or toughness one or less. Um... So it just means that a good chunk of your ninjas are now unblockable. Great to get in there and get the more Yuriko triggers. Um, and some of my favorite, like, slightly more unique cards that aren't maybe just like, no duh, this is good in Yuriko, are Abjur. This is a one-mana blue counterspell, but you have to sack a blue permanent. But since can Commander Ninjutsu avoids commander attacks, it's very easy to sack Yuriko and the Ninjutsu on her on something else later. Um, and March of the Swirling Mist. This is a card I've been very impressed with in this deck. It's whenever you uh, it essentially aces, phases up up to X target creatures. Don't have to be creatures you can control, too. Uh, but you can exile blue cards from your hand. It costs two less for each card exiled this way. So essentially every blue card exiled is another two things um, blinked. Or phased out, excuse me, not blinked. So this gets real crazy real fast, but it's a lot of fun. You use it to save your board. You use it to swing in for lethal. Um, besides that, the deck is just full of these higher cost spells that, you know, either can be reduced with stuff like Delve or they're like these combo spells like this. Uh, I don't know what you call these. The You know, they're two spells because it actually counts both mana costs, which is pretty cool. Also, extra turn to try to get in there. Um Low land count, much like the Marwin deck, because it's a very low to ground deck. Um, not looking to play a super long game, but also uh, Yarko is making you draw cards like crazy, so you don't really even necessarily need a lot of the insane draw engines in this deck. All right, two more decks to talk about. We're going to talk about my Veyron, Voice of Duality. This is actually the deck I just bought, so I can't say anything about how it performs yet. But it looks like a lot of fun. This is a blue-red um, storm list that seeks to win through hope, through n using non-infinite loops. So this is basically intended to be my like casual storm list, the list I can play at most tables and no one's going to care. It's not going to be a bad experience because... People don't like infinites or anything like that. Um, it's just a true cast a million spells, uh, kill people with gutter snipe triggers, kill people with Kessig flame breather triggers, uh, kill people with grape shots and uh, fiery inscriptions, that kind of stuff. But what Veyron essentially does herself is if casting or copying an instant or sorcery would cause a trigger ability of a permanent you control trigger, triggers an additional time, and whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery, she gets plus one, plus one. So you basically just do this to machine gun down people. Stuff like Gutter Snipe or Fire Inscription being the two best, because each of them now deal four damage per instant or sorcery you play. And 
as you can tell, it is very easy to cast 10 sorceries, 10 instances and sorceries in the style of deck uh, to machine gun people down. That's that deck. I don't have as much to say about it because, like I said, it's brand new. Last but kind of least is Zethi, Arcane Bladesmith. This is the in-universe version of Chun-Li. Um, whenever she ETPs, you can exile up to X target instant cards from your graveyard based on how many times you multi-kicked her. Um, whenever she attacks, you can copy each one and you may cast the copies. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, I say this is kind of least because this is definitely my deck that still needs the most work. This is a deck I've had for a long time and not really been able to tune to a point I'm exactly happy with it, but we're trying to get there with it. Uh, this one and Glissa are probably the two decks that are need the most work. This one, Glissa and Fairies are the three decks that need the most work. Um, so those are going to be the three decks I'm probably going to be focusing on for the first chunk of this year to try to get them uh, narrowed or uh, built up better. But this deck just has a lot of like cheap instants that it wants to cast off Zephy flips, um, stuff like High Tide being insane, uh, making all your islands produce double, stuff like a uh, show of confidence, putting plus one plus one counters on stuff, and essentially having storm, um, removal spells, some modal counter spells that are useful still even after you put them under Zephy, um, disenchant that kind of stuff um and then wind conditions are stuff like sphinx's bone one which just does damage based on the amount of instant sorceries you've cast this game uh shark typhoon metallurgic summonings uh monastery mentor murmuring mystic tolerant all making tokens and then either swinging in with the tokens unbuffed or buffing them with stuff like lead and light scribe which buffs everybody for each um magecraft trigger this turn or probably the coolest card in this deck is Candlekeep Inspiration, which basically makes all your creatures base power and toughness XX, where X is the number of cards you own in exile and in your graveyard that are instants and or sorceries, or have an adventure. But basically what this just often means is it's just turn all your tokens into base 7-7s seven and smash. So this is definitely my lowest power deck, and while I'm not trying to turn this into a high power deck, I definitely do want to mess around with it, especially the land base being full of tap lands and stuff like that, um, and an attempt to kind of bring it up to a, a power level I am more happy playing, um, or at least more consistent, you know, that kind of stuff. But that is going to be end of this very long video. Uh, if you stuck it out this long, thank you for watching. Um, I will be doing more magic content, like I said, um, in the future, and I will probably update actually do update videos on some of the decks that I mentioned that I want to work on um, as I make changes or as new cards come out that I'm interested in. Maybe we'll try to get a webcam set up so I can actually show you all the, the physical cards. Um, but I want to thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day. And what are your favorite decks that you've either owned or built this week? I'd love to hear about them in the comments below. Bye-bye.